Hello everyone, this is Ross and welcome to Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I put out for you guys every 9 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays. And um, yeah, we talk a lot about fruits and vegetables and food and things that are going on uh, with my YouTube channel. Maybe I've been in, you know, asked an interesting question or we got an interesting email, maybe an announcement of some sort. You know, all things related to fruit, all things related to vegetables. Um, and what I'm interested about this particular thing. So in this video, we're going to be talking about one, melons, and another question that I thought was rather interesting and something I wanted to talk about anyway. So this person brought this up. The Millennial Gardener asked me, Ross, since you are uh, growing figs in pots, why don't you take black trash bags and cover your pots, um, cover the tops of your pots underneath, so you can cover the drip lines underneath. And then that way the pots don't get watered by the rain. I realize you can't stop the rain from hitting the figs and the leaves, but you can at least protect the plants from uptaking more water than you dictate. Ever think of something like that? Well, yes, I have, and it's actually been done um, by other growers. And I think it's actually very valuable and something I'm going to be doing. This is probably going to be the um, biggest step up in my fig game from this year to next. I think it's going to be really important for someone living in my climate. Um, you know, I've seen it, I've seen it go both ways though, and I've heard it go both, both ways. So for those of you who don't know, I live in a humid climate and figs don't like water. Okay. So if it rains or it's humid, it's not good for the fig. Uh, they can split, it can ruin the quality. They can easily get, get mold. It, you know, it attracts fruit flies. It can really cause a whole host of problems. Okay. So. To kind of combat this, I already water my trees to the absolute minimum because if they also are uptaking water, I think that also increases the splitting, um, you know, decreases the fruit quality for sure. You know, it does a whole bunch of negative things. So it, the problem though becomes when we start getting lots of rain, which usually happens in September, about midway through September. This year it was quite early because we had a, such a dry period that it just came in all at once. We had pretty much all of September wet and most of October wet. And that pretty much ruined my fig season in those portions of the, of the year. And it does that every year. So it kind of stinks how that lines up, you know, with fig season, because that's usually when most of my figs start to ripen is September. Um, so one way to combat this and what Millennial Gardener is saying is cover the pots with trash bags or something else to stop any of the water from the rain getting into the soil. I want to be able to control the exact amount of water that my trees are getting at all moments. I think that's, like I said, immensely important. Um, now, I don't exactly know if I want to go with the trash bags because that's historically what people have used in the past. You know, I'm not He's not reinventing anything. I'm not reinventing anything. It's already been done. I should say inventing anything. It's already been done. But I don't think it's really the best way. I'm trying to figure out if there's a better way, a better product that I can use that's maybe a bit more longer lasting, you know, longer than a trash bag. Also something I can take off easily and put back on more easy. So, you know, I think trash bags are a good cheap alternative, especially for me who has a ton of a ton of pots that I need to cover at least probably at least a hundred or so fig trees in pots so with that I, I it needs to be inexpensive so if anyone has any ideas of what I could do to cover them um, that'd be great because I'm kind of in the process of brainstorming and kind of trying to come up with ways that I can pretty much uh, solve this issue hopefully for good now there's two different schools of thoughts two different school of thoughts right schools of thought. Uh, basically, you can have, um, when it comes to humidity, people will say, okay, it has nothing to do with the water and the soil. Because if I'm growing my figs in a greenhouse, this is what I've heard from a friend who grows his figs in a greenhouse, and that's it. He doesn't grow them outside. If it's raining outside, or if it's humid outside, then my figs tend to split. Well, I don't think that's exactly true uh, because for me, when I'm putting my figs in the greenhouse now, you know, it's it's uh, almost mid-November here, 
I'm putting my my fig trees that haven't ripened the full crop yet, like black Madeira as an example, I'm throwing that in the greenhouse. And then that way it doesn't get hit with the rain. It doesn't split. Black Madeira really easily splits. So by me putting the greenhouse, obviously protects it from the rain, protects it from the humidity. But in my greenhouse, I have a whole bunch of other plants. So many plants that the humidity in the greenhouse is actually like like over 80% for sure. It's very high. Uh, because all those leaves in there, because none of the trees in there are dormant. A lot of them I'm protecting from the frost or continuing them so that I can get more figs off in them. You know, none of them are dormant and they still have their leaves and that leaves, those leaves are transpirating water into the greenhouse, which is creating a lot of humidity. So I have a humid, humid environment in my greenhouse, regardless of what's outside. If it's raining or not, it doesn't seem to matter because nothing in my greenhouse is splitting. Absolutely nothing, even though I have all this crazy humidity. Why is that? Because I've completely controlled the water in those pots in the greenhouse. I haven't watered them a single time. And they've been in there, some of them have been in there for three weeks, some of them have been in there for a month. So if I'm able to control the water, I really do think that is the answer. I do think there's probably some humidity there that that uh, definitely has an effect for sure. I'm not going to lie to you, but I think water is the biggest case. And if I can cover the pots, control the water, even if it's downpouring outside, I probably will have a, a much better um, crop next year. You know, I think that's a guarantee. So again, if anybody has any tips of like, or things I could use maybe some kind of building material or some kind of plastic, something I can cover the tops of the pots. You know, you got to wrap it around the trunk, right? You got to be able to get it on and off easily. And it, and it just has to stay on the pot. And any excess water needs to shed off of the pot. So, yeah, that'd be great. The next thing I want to talk about is melons. And we talked about melons last week in Fruit Talk, last week's episode. And I showed you guys this book that I got. It's called, um, what is it called? Melons for the Passionate Grower. Sounds like me. And um, it's by Amy Goldman. She works with the Seed Savers Exchange. We're going to show you guys some things about the Seed Saver Exchange in just a minute. But, you know, basically she wrote this book with the intention of teaching people about growing melons, but more specifically telling them about the many varieties of melons and which ones you should go for and which ones you should avoid or, you know, uh, telling us all about the heirlooms. You know, she's really all about heirlooms, not about hybrids. And I sort of agree with her. She makes a very good point in this book about it. I also highly recommend getting this book. Um, and the whole reason I'm all into these melons now is because I went to Japan just really quickly, and I ate a melon there that changed my life. Melons are, at a minimum, per melon, $10 there. Some of them go for over $100 per melon. Um, they really are a spectacular fruit, and if you can ripen them at home, pick them at the op optimal time, pick the right varieties, you will get an incredible melon. That's without, without a doubt. So it's easier said than done, and I think this book has certainly helped uh, helped me, uh, will help me achieve that. She talks about, you know, in this book, she, she talks about, uh, why she loves them. And she talks about tips for harvesting. I think one of the big ones is kind of feeling the bottom, just like a fig, you know, you want to feel the neck. If the neck is soft, the entirety of it is pretty soft. It's good. Uh, same thing with the melon. You need to make sure that the melon, at least most of them, not all of them, there's different types and each melon has different little nuances. Some of them turn color. Some of them, um, when it's attached to the to the vine, if you give it a little tug, it should come off very easily. You know, uh, bottom though, which I think is probably the best indicator for a lot of them, it shouldn't be too soft and it shouldn't be too hard. So there's a little bit of learning curve there with me that it's going to have to happen. Um, but eventually I'll figure it out. Just like the fig. You touch the fig, you figure out just how soft it is, and you pick it. So she also talks about here, let's see, what else? How to grow them, obviously. 
Um, I know water is a big one. She puts down black plastic. She grows them in zone 5, believe it or not. A very much colder place than I. But she grows them on hills, on, um, you know, on, with black plastic. Other sources of heat, just like figs. It's so interesting how she's doing all these um, important things for melons that it just totally makes sense to do the same thing for figs. You just need to give them a lot of heat, guys. Transplant them when the, the soil temperatures, uh, you know, at the right temperature. The Obviously, the warmer, the better. Um, she covers the seedlings, by the way, the young transplants, I should say, with a row cover, protecting them from uh, pests and whatnot. And then once the temperatures start to get a little bit warmer, the pests start to go away. She then uncovers them, and with the help of the black plastic, they take off. She talks about saving seeds, and she talks about uh, hand pollinating them. And then she goes on to talk about some recipes, things you can do with melons. But more, most importantly, she eats them raw. And then she goes on to talk about heirlooms and how they're superior to hybrids. And then finally, she gets to the most important thing in my mind is the varieties and all the amazing, tasty, tasty varieties. The first section that she goes over, she mentions that there's three types of melons, three species of melons. One is a cantaloupe. Um, the second are musk melons. And then the third is a, uh, I forget the species name, but it's a broad category of melons that can cover all kinds of interesting little melons, um, even cucumbers, what we would consider cucumbers, but, um, or what we would consider, we would consider these weird cucumbers to be cucumbers, they're more um, in the melon family. So she goes over all three types, but really there's only two that I'm interested in the most, which is cantaloupe and musk melons. And here's the weird thing that I learned in this book that she probably answers, here's the fun fact, right? She probably answers this question all the time and just it's like the easiest most ridiculous thing that you probably would shake your head at if you really grew a lot of melons is that what we know of in, Amer in america as a cantaloupe is actually a musk melon and what we know as honeydew in america is actually a musk melon as well so we've never really eaten a cantaloupe i've never eaten a cantaloupe I've only eaten muskmelons. I don't even know what a cantaloupe tastes like. Uh, so cantaloupes are quite different. I'll show you guys pictures right now. So you can see this melon here. It's got these like ridges in them, kind of like a pumpkin does. See what I'm talking about? They've got these like ridges at each little section of the melon. They're also quite smooth on the outside, kind of like a squash or a pumpkin, like I said. Um, you know, some of them actually split at the top. So you can see on this melon here, the top here is actually split open. Um, some of these cantaloupes, they they just don't have that netting, right? They don't have that netting, and they don't. They have a smoother skin, and they usually have those ridges in them. And they're very, very beautiful, and they're very, very tasty. So we haven't basically been, I think, because. They're a bit harder to grow, I believe. And a lot of the cantaloupe varieties that you'll find that have been cultivated as heirlooms, some of them have a bit more problems to them, like like the splitting that I mentioned. Um, there's a few other things in here that she mentions that it kind of gives me the, the thought that, oh, that's why we only have musk melons really sold in the stores because they're just more difficult to deal with uh, cantaloupes. Now, if we go to the cantaloupe section, really quickly, you'll see the netting that I'm talking about on all of these musk melons. That's the key feature of them. See how that they're netting like that? And what I want to do right now is not, instead of showing you guys this book, I want to show you guys all the melons that I chose. Okay, so reading through her book, reading through all the opinions that she gave. She even did bricks readings, gave the history of each one, tells you the weight, tells you the, you know, the sugar content, the ripening season, any synonyms, um, you know, all kinds of things. She goes into very great detail, and I've, I highly appreciate it because these, this book, it will save me years of trial and error and money, for sure. So 
I've mainly chosen early to, uh, early to mid-season varieties because I'm in zone 7 and this is definitely a crop that's a bit more difficult to grow. Um, the other thing that we struggle with is Fusarium wilt. And I really hope that this particular garden patch that I'm going to put them in this year doesn't have any Fusarium wilt. I've never seen it there, but um, I think there's a few things I want to completely avoid just to make sure that I don't get any Fusari in wilt this year. Um, it may be impossible, but anyway, let's get into the varieties here. So this is um, one variety, and I, I'm not going to even try to pronounce some of these, but she goes into really great detail of some of these melons that I've chosen. This is one that she highly, highly recommends. Um, so this is one here, and you can tell this is a, this is a cantaloupe even though it, it's green on the inside. And I think because it's verte, that means green in France. So just because it's um, a cantaloupe doesn't mean it has to be orange. And this is one of the green cantaloupes that she really, really likes. Here's a Kajari melon, which she doesn't recommend. She, I don't think she, um, you know, this may be something more new or something she didn't have access to by the time she published this book, which was in... 2002, I believe. So this thing is a, a bit out of date, I think. Is it 2002 or is it 2008? Yeah, 2002. So this thing's a little bit older, but you know, there's this is a new variety here, Kajari melon, that I put a lot of research in previously, and have come to the conclusion this is a really tasty melon. So. Regardless of, and it also should perform well here. It's an earlier uh, melon. And uh, regardless of, you know, whether or not this is in the book, if I see something that I think is interesting on the internet, I'm going to see if I can try it and see if it's worth a shot, right? You know, I'm not going to be just um, zoned in to the, whatever she says in this book. Yeah, I'm going to take her word for it. Cause she's been doing this just like I've been doing figs, right? You know, Bet your ass, if someone grew something as passionate as I did and in the quantity as I did, I'm certainly going to be paying attention to what she has to say. Um, here's a watermelon that she highly recommends. She also has a section on watermelons. I forgot about that. And these are two watermelons that I really, really like. One, because they're smaller. They're more personal sized. For me, I'm going to be growing them vertically up trellises. So... A smaller watermelon or a smaller melon is really going to help me um, be able to grow these things vertically. They're also more productive that way, usually. And something like Blacktail Mountain is very early, perfect for short season areas. I didn't try to get the tastiest watermelons. This wasn't on my list of things to do. Um, there's Alibaba, Orange Glow, Sugar Baby. You know, those are some really tasty watermelons of heirlooms that have high reputations but i didn't go for that with the watermelons i also went with golden midget which is another one that's great for short seasons very productive in her book amy talks about just how productive this is and it's the best melon she has i think she says if she were to grow one watermelon or something like that this is the one she would do or something like that here's a charente taste melon which is a sub, I think it's a subsection of cantaloupe. And I totally botched the pronunciation there. But this particular type of melon has been cultivated and prized in France for years. And they've been uh, really obsessing over these things and really trying to get them perfect and beautiful. And this is just one that I found on the Seed Saver Exchange website that I just have to grow a type like this and see what it's all about, you know? Very beautiful. They even sell this subsection of cantaloupe, they sell them as hybrids as well. So this may be the only, I mean, this one here is an heirloom, but of any of the melons I'm going to grow, this may be the only one I would consider growing as a hybrid. Um, but, you know, it's very easy to save seeds with melons and having them as an heirloom that you can save seeds year after year and even potentially adapt to your climate, improve over the years. That's something I want to be focusing on. You know, 
all these melons are going to grow, and not all of them are going to perform well. I'm going to need to make some hard choices, see what did well and what didn't do well, and then next year grow that. You know, save the seeds from it every year, and then 20 years from now, who knows, I may have a really incredible melon that does, in fact, perform well. You know, they should be seed stable. They should be, um, they should be pretty stable, these seeds, at this point, if they've been collected and saved for years. But, um, you know, they will certainly adapt, just like any plant you save over time. Maybe if you choose the best one every year and save seeds from that, they certainly will change slightly over the years, you know, and you may get a more improved version of what they're selling here. Um, here's another one. Ha Ogden is one that I'm, Ha Ogden is one that I'm uh, trialing as well. And this is, I believe, yes, this is another cantaloupe. And we still haven't even gotten into muskmelons yet, guys. <laughs> but this is um, similar to the, the Verte that we showed you guys uh, on the on Baker Creek. I don't know how I deleted that somehow, but yeah, this is it's similar to this melon, as Amy Goldman says, in that it's a cantaloupe with the green interior. So this is another one that we'll see if how well this one does, and she really likes them both. To be honest with you, um, as we go on, we finally get to the musk melons, and this is called Eden's Gem, an early maturing melon. Again, this is a, also a smaller melon. That she really recommends. Um, I'm also growing Jenny Lynn, a melon called Jenny Lynn. This is what this is supposed to be, even though it's not it's not lettuce. But here it is right here. So Jenny Lynn, another one. These are just you know melons that I came across, and you can go into her book, guys. I'm not going to read every little thing, but you know, she says in her book it says. Uh, Burpee's 1907 Farm Annual touted the button as the best part, which is the Audi belly button that this melon has on the bottom. And um, they say it's the best part, a delicious morsel, intensely sweet. I don't know if I buy that because she likes the uh, middle of the melon, but she will uh, wax enthusiastic over Jenny's other fine virtues very early uh, maturity and I think this one was more chosen not necessarily for the taste but definitely for the fact that it's so early now one melon that she really really loves and I'm going to find it here and read it to you guys is it's called the Petite Grease and this is the melon right here so this guy here um, has a brown sugar flavor is what she said. This is a really fantastic melon. Um, let's see what she says here about the flavor. She does mention on this particular um, this particular melon that melon plants are often grafted onto a squash rootstock. Um, to basically fight off and help with Fusarium wilt. So that's really, really cool. And then they aspire them off to keep them off the ground, similar to how I'm doing it. That would be interesting to see. And that, if I fail this year with Fusarium wilt, that might just have to be, um, you know, the next step in my melon journey. She says here that Petite Grease is so good, it gives me the chills. As wonderful as a Charente melon is, Petite grow, goes a baby step further, making it la creme de la creme of French melons. You will blink your eyes with disbelief when you sample its sweetness, which is more like brown sugar than white. It will melt in your tongue and your mouth will water for more. I mean, this melon has got to be, <laughs> it's got to be nuts, right? Uh, here's another one here that I it looks like to me another cantaloupe but in actuality she has it listed here as a musk melon so weird but maybe it's not the same maybe it is and then we have Noir de Carmes this is another cantaloupe I think the cantaloupes really are um, interesting more more interesting than the 
the musk melons for sure. I think the cantaloupes are really where it's at when it comes to, to flavor. Um, although, and I hesitate to say that because in Japan, the melon I ate, I believe, is a musk melon. I never saw the outside. I never actually saw the melon itself. Other than, actually, you know what? I did see the melon itself. I just never looked on the bottom. So, I don't know. But it seems like the uh, the cantaloupes are definitely a better choice. And this is another one that she really, really loves. Um, one of the easiest to grow, it says down here, and most luxurious of all melons. This one uh, is complex, deeply satisfying, it says, and it tends to split. Now, I want to show you guys a picture. This is what I meant, I think, by the splitting that I was mentioning before. But this is one that she really, yeah, here it is. So we showed you guys this one. See the top there, how it's splitting? And she says the reason, if you're interested, for the for why it splits. I think if you leave it on there too long, it does split. So you have to make sure that you're, it kind of is an uh, indicator of when it's right in actuality. If you're selling this for um, commercial ability for, for uh, to sell, you know, you would obviously pick this a bit earlier. But this melon is so nice that it literally lets you know when it's right. Unfortunately, it splits open, and if it splits open, it doesn't last nearly as long on the counter, so you kind of have to eat it right away, but um, it's kind of easy as it gets. That's why it's one of the easiest to grow, as they say here. So really, really cool, this melon, even though it splits. And then here's Minnesota Midget. This is, she said, her best melon that she grows um, in a colder, short-season climate. So pretty, pretty cool. I'm uh, really excited to be doing this. Very passionate melon grower, as you can tell. And um, yeah, I'm just very excited to show you guys what the melon plants are doing next year, do some taste tests. I mean, this is gonna be, I really believe that, and it took me forever to realize this too, because growing figs, I knew for so long that there were so many interesting flavors and really some interesting intricacies of growing figs that, I think there's a similar thing with melons as well. You know, it's a similar thing. Less water, you know, pick it at the exact right time. You know, all of that is so, so key. You know, maximum sunlight, maximum heat, you know, uh, minimal water. I mean, I feel like a broken record talking about the same things when it comes to melons and, and figs. So hopefully that helps me. I already got the basis going in there, but you never know what that Fusarium will. So. Anyway, guys, that's going to be it for Fruit Talk Episode 6, I think this was. So we're, we're getting rolling here. We're doing this for six weeks. And I've also put out at least 120 videos in a row every day. Put out a video a day for 120 days. So hopefully you guys have been enjoying this, not only my podcast, but also just all the videos in general. So take care, everyone, and uh, I'll talk to you all soon.